So in today's session, we're going to look at using a systems design approach to size our pipework and circulating pump. By systems design approach, we mean considering all elements or components in the system connected together. This allows us to consider component interaction in the system. Using spreadsheets or hand calculations, consider elements in isolation, and this is unlikely to provide you with an optimal or flexible design solution. Adopting a systems design approach is therefore key to understanding the true performance of the system, which is what we have in this design scenario. Let's now use this design case to examine the steps involved in the process design of a liquid transfer system. The fluid in this case is phenol, which is pumped from a storage tank to a reaction vessel. The storage tank contains phenol at 60 degrees C and has an elevation of 0.8 meters with a liquid level of 1 meter. The pump has an elevation of 0 meters and the reaction vessel is positioned at an elevation of 4 meters. The connected pipework has a total length of over 385 meters and includes a feed heater, a series of bends, a check valve and a number of diaphragm isolation valves. A design flow rate of 60 meter cube per hour of phenol at 60 degrees C has been determined by the continuous production rate required at the reactor. The feed heater in the line increases the temperature of the phenol from 60 to 80 degrees C prior to transfer to the reactor. Using this design flow rate, we will consider how to size the pipes, size the pump and determine the actual mechanism for achieving our design flow and also consider pipe heat loss. At this point in the process you may ask yourself, where do I start? To size any pump or compressor, transport any fluid, the first two steps we should consider are Define the flow rate that the pump is required to deliver, and this is usually determined from the design mass balance of the process in which the pump is installed. In this case, we know the design flow rate is 60 meter cube per hour. The second step is to determine the total differential head that the pump must generate in order to deliver the required design flow rate. Since the head any pump will develop is dependent on the piping system and elevation differences, we can immediately recognize that it is impossible to size a pump without considering the piping system. It's worth noting at this stage that pumps and compressors are not do-all devices and that they really must be matched to the system. Often a good starting point is to size the pipework using economic design criteria. And for anyone interested, we have a really useful article on our website under the resources section which discusses this topic of economic pipe sizing. In essence, economic design criteria considers maintenance costs, energy costs, installation costs, operating frequency of the system, etc. And these parameters are different for different pipe materials. And before we size the pipework, we should decide the mechanism we are going to use to deliver the 60 meter cube per hour of phenol. We basically have two options available. Use a flow control valve or other throttling device, or we can use a variable speed drive on the pump. Control valve sizing is the subject of a separate webinar in the near future and as such we will choose a variable speed pump in this case. We have a number of options to choose from to automatically size our pipework. This includes economic velocity, a design velocity or design pressure gradient. We are going to choose economic velocity as we wish to develop an economic system design. By calculating the model the software has determined an economic velocity of 1.16 meters per second which gives us an exact economic pipe size of 135.3 millimeters. And as a side note, you can determine the economic velocity from our free online calculator on our website or using fluid flow software. Using the near standard pipe size to 135.3 millimeters for steel pipework means we either choose a 125 or 150 millimeter pipe. And we can see here, using a 125 millimeter pipe, gives us a velocity of 1.32 meters per second. We can increase this pipe diameter to 150, and let's have a look at the velocity. Now we can see the velocity is reduced to 0.93 meters per second. The size you choose will depend on your circumstances. Some factors you may wish to consider might be the future likelihood of increasing capacity in the system, 
existence of a subset of standardized pipe sizes in your organization, intermittent or 24-7 operation, erosion, particle settling, etc. In this case, we are going to proceed with 150 millimeters. This means we're now ready to complete the system loss calculation, which determines the total head required by the pump. Sizing the pump means specifying the head and flow at which the pump will operate. This is called the duty point. And remember, a pump will always operate where the pump performance curve and system curve intersect. The system loss calculation can be made quite easily using the automatically sized function which we just looked at earlier. We have set the design flow rate to 60 meter cube per hour. You could set the design duty pressurize if the information were available. From the solution, we can see that the pump duty pressurize is 8.1 meters of fluid and the net positive suction head available in the system is 11.5 meters of fluid. We can also see that there is substantial heat loss in some of the pipes which we will revisit a little later. Before we fill out our pump data sheet and contact our pump supplier, there are other considerations we should make such as, is the net positive suction head available a sufficient margin? The volumetric flow rate after the heater increases. Will this impact on my system design? Start up and shut down. Do we need to drain the line as phenol solidifies at 40 degrees C? Should we steam trace or heat the line? Do we need any relief devices? Can we experience transients? Our recommendation is always leave the pump selection to the pump supplier who will consider many factors such as correct selection of pump build materials, adjustment of water-based NPSH curves for the temperature and fluid you are pumping to ensure no cavitation will occur, ensure that the duty point is near the best efficiency point, correct the pump performance curves for any viscosity effects, and so on. Let's now consider that we have approached a pump vendor to select a suitable pump for this system and let's assign this pump to the system. We can solve the system based on this specific pump and evaluate its performance. In this case, the pump delivers approximately 59 meters cubed per hour with a duty pressure rise of 8 meters of fluid. The net positive suction head requirement is 3.7 meters of fluid. And since we have an NPSHA of 11.5 meters of fluid, we are, we are within the acceptable operating limits for the pump. The efficiency is 62% with a power requirement of 2.2 kilowatts. We can also view the duty point on the pump curve which helps us establish how close the duty point is to the best efficiency point. This particular system curve also shows the static head requirement arising from the elevation difference between the supply and delivery liquid levels. You might note that we need to deliver slightly more flow from the pump than we have solved in this case. Let's set about increasing the pump speed to match our design requirement. OK. If we increase the pump speed to 1871 RPM, the duty flow now becomes 60 meters cubed per hour, with a subtle increase in duty pressure raised to 8.1 meters of fluid. The duty efficiency is 62% and the duty power is 2.2 kilowatts. A quick check on the NPSH conditions confirms that we are still within the safe operating limits for the pump. We can also make a quick check on the pump curves to review the performance. You may also notice that we have a warning message. This is just letting us know that the booster affinity laws have been applied since we have changed the pump operating speed. So far we have sized our pipework and our pump and optimized the pump operating performance. Let's now consider the effects of oversizing the system pipework. We had assigned a size of 150 millimeters originally. What if we had selected a size of, let's say, 250 millimeters? As we can see, the pump efficiency drops off to 31% and the power requirement in increases to 3 kilowatts. You may also note that we now have warning messages for the pump.
So what could possibly be happening? The warning is advising us that the net positive suction head available is insufficient to meet the needs of the pump net positive suction head requirement. Let's have a look. So we have 11.6 meters of fluid available and we have a requirement of 14.7. So we have a problem which can more than likely lead to cavitation uh, of the pump, premature failure of the pump, which obviously can lead to increased maintenance uh, costs and potential plant shutdowns, which of course can have very costly consequences. This scenario considered a pipe size which was two sizes greater than the optimum selection, but what if we had only selected a pipe size which was just one size greater than the economic suggestion? Let's try 200 millimeters. So now we will make all pipes 200 millimeter in diameter and let's see how efficient the solution is. So we still have a warning for the pump. We can have a quick look. So the warning is telling us once again the uh, booster affinity laws have been applied uh, and the duty point is beyond the maximum recommended uh, flow. Let's look at the results. And we can see the net positive suction head required is 10.6 meters of fluid and that available is just slightly over at 11.6 meters of fluid. And the Hydraulic Institute recommends that an NPSH margin, that's the ratio of net positive suction head available divided by that required uh, by the pump, uh, of the range 1.1 to 2.5 depending on suction energy levels is an ideal operating uh, scenario. This particular operating condition develops a ratio of 1.09 which is just below this recommendation so perhaps not an ideal solution. A quick check on the pump curve illustrates just how the pump performance has dropped off. We can see the efficiency is 43%. Let's have a look at the curves. And we can see we've dropped off the uh, optimum position of the capacity curve and we're quite some distance now from the best efficiency point on the uh, red efficiency curve. Let's return our pipes to the economic solution of 150 millimeters. Okay. Okay, and we still have the booster affinity law warning, which is fine. Earlier we made reference to pipe heat loss. We are adding some 20 degrees C to the phenol at the feed heater, which equates to around 542 kilowatts of heat energy. Downstream of this heater, we have a considerable length of pipework where we are subsequently losing over 182 kilowatts of heat. The calculation of pipe heat loss takes into account the local ambient temperature, wind speed, surface emissivity, etc. The result is that the temperature of the phenol is just 67 degrees at the supply point to the reactor. We therefore need to consider the inclusion of thermal insulation to the pipework to minimize this wasteful heat loss and also for personal protection purposes. Let's try adding 25 millimeters of mineral wool insulation to all pipes. And now we can see that the heat loss in this uh, single pipe alone, which, okay, has a length of 385 meters, drops from 182 to just 20 kilowatts. If we were to increase this insulation thickness to 50 millimeters, we can see that the heat loss reduces to around 12 kilowatts. But most importantly, the temperature of the phenol at the supply point to the reactor is now 80 degrees C. Now we are much closer to an efficient and elegant design solution. This design case has touched on some of the important factors to consider when sizing pipes and pumps.